um, I guess I guess that um, some of you will be more work versed in this than others, depending on whether you're um, a, a patient or parent of a patient who's had um, a, a IH from their childhood, or whether um, you're here because you're somebody who's developed it later in life. Um, so I'll give a bit of background for those who are um, sort of less uh, um, aware of what's been happening in paediatrics. So. Um, historically, it was assumed to be very similar to what happens in adults. And over the last 20 years, um, there's been increasing recognition that paediatric IH is probably a separate disease entity with some similarities and some differences from the adult condition. Um, sorry for this busy slide. Um, I wanted to give you a bit of a comparison between paediatric IH and adult IH. Um, and uh, um, for those who are sort of... Um, less uh, less um, wanting to look at lots and lots of figures and details, um, I would suggest that you look at the main bullet points and those who like to look at the, the uh, details, there's a bit more detail there as well, and some references for those who are interested to read more. Um, so firstly, we see a lower incidence of, of IH in children compared to adults. Um, secondly, uh, um, obesity as a whole is less common in pediatric IH, um, although it does depend in which age group we're talking about. So um, in pre-pubertal children, obesity is much less common. So it's um, only 43% of children who are pre-pubertal and having IH are obese. Whereas when you get up to the older age groups, um, it's reaching similar um, percentages to that that we might see in adults, um, at least from the data so far. And the gender difference um, seems to be less marked in children than in adults. So um, whereas, as you know, um, most of the adult patients with IH are female, in children under the age of 12, it's actually 50-50. Um, and because of the differences that we know about so far, which are these, and probably other differences that we don't understand so well, um, we um, in Cambridge and um, wider afield feel that we need a slightly different approach for diagnosis and management of IH in children compared to adults. And currently, most centres use the modified Frieden, Frieden criteria that we use in adults, um, but we try to ad adapt, the, um, adapt the, the criteria to children a little bit, um, particularly with regard to things like reference ranges um, of uh, CSF pressures. Um, and we try to adapt the adult consensus guideline developed by Professor Sinclair and uh, Ms. Mullen, which is so useful and so detailed, um, and I think has really improved the care for adults with IH. So this is just, um, again, another busy slide um, to, uh, to summarize um, the service that we provide in the East of England for um, children with IH. So we have a monthly multidisciplinary team meeting um, with most of these people um, uh, attending that meeting um, as, as needed. Um, so uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar is our service lead. Um, Ms. Muthuswami is our neuro-ophthalmology lead. Um, and we have a number of colleagues in the team as well. Um, so we have specialist nurses, we have brain physicists, um, we have neuroradiologists, neurosurgeons. Um, and um, I'm aware that uh, this is our current team and a lot of the work that we um, have done as a team in Cambridge um, was led by um, Professor Picard in the past, um, Dr. Parker, who is, um, uh, 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 works very much in pediatric neurology still, but um, ha has um, become less involved in the IH service as time has gone on. And Mr. Garnett again, who is very much involved in the pediatric neurosurgery service, but has become less involved directly in pediatric IH as time has gone on. Um, on the right side of this slide, you can see um, the pathway that we've developed over the years for suspected IH in children. Um, and this continues to evolve. So although this is the current pathway, there are still some, um, some tweaks that we continue to make to this to try and improve it as, as we go, go on. Um, but essentially, um, our colleagues across the region are, are much, much more informed of the types of assessment and investigation that they need to do before they refer to us at, in Cambridge for further assessment of children with suspected IAH. And this has really helped us to improve the care that we provide for children uh, over the region. Although of course, there's always scope for further improvement. Um, so this is just to demonstrate a regional service evaluation that we did fairly recently um, between the time period of August, 2018 and August, 2020. 
Um, and in that time, we had 92 referrals of children with suspected IAH. And out of those, we diagnosed 19 as having IAH using our um, in adaptation and interpretation of the Friedman criteria for children um, and those adult consensus guidelines that you're already aware of. Um, and of our population, um, just over half were female. Um, they, they were um, had, they had a mean age of 10, but there was a, a, a variation. Um, the BMI um, was, was slightly towards the upper end of normal in children because uh, a BMI of um, 25 is, uh, is slightly higher than we'd expect for most children. Um, but within those, we saw that um, uh, some, some of them were uh, um, obese or overweight and some of them weren't. And in fact, some of them actually had a low BMI. Um, and if you take the percentages, probably most of these children um, had a low, normal or low BMI. Um, so it's slightly different from the um, figures that we might expect if we were looking at a similar um, uh, evaluation in adults. Um, and we found that um, in most of these um, children, they had presented with headaches. Um, they also had a variety of other symptoms of presentation. Um, and a significant but um, minority of these had abnormal visual function of presentation. Um, a number of them had abnormalities on their MRI scan, um, which would be consistent with IAH, although, of course, MRI findings are used to, to support rather than diagnose IAH. Um, and the lumbar puncture um, study and CSF infusion study, which is, a, uh, for those of you who are not aware, a particular um, extension of the lumbar puncture um, that we have particularly developed in Cambridge um, was, um, was abnormal in these children. And um, they were treated in the main with medical treatment, um, although uh, one required a ventricular peritoneal shunt. And I saw that in the chat um, was uh, somebody had mentioned that, uh, that they indeed have a, a, a VP shunt as well. Um, and um, in the, uh, when we looked at the outcomes, um, we found that most of these children achieved a symptom resolution um, and almost all of them, the papilledema improved over time. Um, we also did a patient experience survey um, with members um, from IH UK um, about 18 months ago now. Um, and this, we had um, a relatively small response, um, but um, those responses were very detailed. So we had responses from five, um, five, five people who are parents of children or young people with IH. Um, and I think that the, there were some clear learning points for us from this patient experience survey, um, which we've tried to work on over this 18 months. So um, particularly, it was identified that uh, parents noted the need for, for more information um, about different aspects of their care. So that could be more information um, at the clinic appointment regarding the condition, uh, more information about the, the notice that they get before they come in for lumbar puncture, um, more information and support to the child and the parent during the lumbar puncture, and information about when to expect the results. Um, there was uh, a note of need for pain relief after lumbar puncture, and there was an, a note about the um, complications that patients and uh, children and young people developed um, after their lumbar puncture, and this varied between sickness, a bad headache, um, to back pain, and being unable to move their legs, and indeed resulting in an admission to hospital following their lumbar puncture. Um, and I think that um, uh, as professionals, we're, we're always learning from, from you as um, patients and parents. Um, and certainly some of these um, things on the list here are things that uh, we wouldn't have um, realized uh, if it had not been for this patient experience survey that we weren't doing them. So if you had asked me whether these things were important, I would have said, of course they are. If you'd asked me whether I was doing them, I would have said, of course. But actually, I realized that that may not be the case when I um, realized uh, that if we actually ask you for this information, we may learn from you that we're not always getting it right and that there are some points that we need to improve. This is um, a list of the um, publications and presentations that have been done on the subject of paediatric um, pseudotumor cerebrosis syndrome or IAH um, and I describe it in that way because some of these um, presentations and publications have been by many different um, members of our team um, both past and present um, 
uh, they have been around subjects which relate either to IIH or also to um, race intracranial pressure, which is secondary to other causes, including traumatic brain injury. Um, and there has been, as you can see from this selected um, list of publications, there's been a long standing interest and there's been many people involved in this work. Um, and I really wanted to convey that um, that as a group um, in our region, uh, we have many, many people who are really interested in trying to improve the care of um, children with IAH and PTCS in our region. Going on to a little bit about the work that um, has been done nationally and how we have been involved in that. Um, so there has been some work to raise the national profile of pediatric IAH, um, which as I say, um, initially um, was, was well, less well um, described separately than adult IH. Um, and there has been the development, um, but not completion yet, of the National Pediatric IH Guideline. So in terms of raising the profile, um, uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar and colleagues have been very involved in establishing a subgroup for PTCS, sorry, typo there, PTCS and IAH um, in, in the, within the BPNA or British Pediatric Neurology Association's Children's Headache Network. Um, and now um, having, uh, you know, over, over time we've developed um, three meetings per year. And at that meeting, we usually have between 15 and 20 um, attendees who are the professionals from across the country um, and with the advent of virtual working of course that's made things um, uh, a little easier at least from the point of view of attending um, consistently um, uh, and regularly um, and we uh, have established an annual national pediatric PTCSIH study day for professionals um, which is now in its third year um, uh, that we, when we started doing these study days, um, the first one was um, in person and face to face in Cambridge. Um, and um, subsequently, we've run a virtual study day last year, and we plan to attend to run a further study day this year, um, which at the moment is looking like it will be virtual. Um, in the 2019 study day, um, we had a patient and parent talk, um, and this was really well received, um, both by um, uh, by, by the, um, the ophthalmologists, neurologists, pediatricians, all by, by you know, many different professionals were there. But we all learned a lot from hearing the patient experience, um, and um, and that was around. There were several learning points from those talks, but I particularly remember um, uh, the, the mention of. Um, the difficult experience around a lumbar puncture um, and the need for more information about the complications to expect um, following the lumbar puncture. And again, this is um, a, a theme that, that runs through from the patient experience questionnaire as well. Um, we had a virtual meeting last year and at that meeting we had 56 attendees. Um, and again, we had a, a, a large uh, representation from various different specialities, bearing in mind that um, that all of these specialities are relatively small compared to our adult counterparts. Um, so, you know, if you take the total numbers of any of these uh, specialists, they're all um, less in total numbers than um, our adult counterparts. Um, so I think um, that it was really um, encouraging to see 56 attendees at that meeting. In terms of the development of national pediatric guidelines, um, so we have um, uh, been aiming to develop the surveillance and management recommendations for those newly diagnosed, suspected, or already diagnosed with IAH. Um, and we have gone through um, a Delphi consensus process um, in which um, we develop statements um, and um, ask for um, uh, professionals to, to, um, to tell us whether they agree or disagree with the statement. Um, and consensus for the purpose of this Delphi consensus process was defined as 70% agreement amongst participants. And of course that varies between different Delphi consensus processes. People set the standards at different levels. Um, and we received responses from neurologists, um, pediatricians, ophthalmologists, neurosurgeons, neuroradiologists, neuro and opticians for this. Um, and completed the first round at the beginning of last year the second round at the end of last year. Um, and we had a, a pretty good response rate compared to other 
um, similar studies that have been done in the past. Um, and again, keeping in mind the relative um, small numbers of professionals in each of these areas um, due to the nature of the specialities. And the analysis of these um, responses is still in progress. Um, we, we continue to meet regularly and to, um, to, to, to try and address what the areas where we have contentious points and we need to develop further consensus um, uh, and, and also to try and provide as much clarity as, as uh, possible to inform the development of, the, of a guideline. Um, and Dr. Krishna Kumar has been in um, uh, frequent sort of uh, discussions with all of the interested parties, and that includes the, the relevant royal colleges um, uh, who have in the main been supportive and interested um, to try and take this work um, forward in, in all of these sort of um, relevant and official uh, ways. Um, some of this work was pre presented um, in the BPNA um, meeting or British Pediatric Neurology Association meeting um, as a poster um, at the beginning of last year. Um, and again, I think this shows the, uh, another way that we've sort of tried to um, increase the profile of pediatric IAH amongst our colleagues. So um, I'm coming towards the, towards the end of what I was going to say to you in the hope that we can have a bit of discussion as well. Um, the sorts of things that, um, that, that we as a, as a group had thought about in terms of how you might be able and um, might want to get involved uh, are listed here. Um, but I'm aware that there may be many things that we haven't thought of and I'd be really interested to hear um, from members of IAH UK about what you think is important for you. Um, so we're always interested in hearing more about your perspective um, as, as the, the, the patients and parents of uh, patients who, who actually have the condition. Um, and it was really interesting to me to hear Melissa's talk um, about her own perspective and also the, the idea of expression and therapy of the condition um, using art and other similar conditions as well. Um, and, and a lot of the work that Melissa presented was, was new to me um, and really provide, provided me with a new perspective uh, on things. So I think that can, that can be really, really helpful to us as professionals. Um, uh, and, you know, I was thinking when Melissa was saying, um, uh, when the hell, I, th I think Melissa used the terminology or something like, uh, when, the, when, we, when healthcare professionals um, think about things. And I was thinking in the same way, I'm trying to see it from the other side. And it was really interesting to kind of marry up those two perspectives and, and think about what we may um, be missing if we don't um, ask for your perspective enough. Um, and then in terms of another way that you might want to get involved, um, patient information leaflets um, are something that we're always aware that we need to develop and um, uh, improve. Um, and it would be really useful to know what areas could be more useful for you. Um, so for example, from our previous um, uh, IH study day where we had some attendance from some of you, um, we were aware that um, some of the things that you want to know to make sure is, is, um, is communicated better is the potential complications around lumbar punctures. And so we've taken efforts to improve that information that we provide to patients in our service for around that. Um, and uh, you know, what else would you like to uh, like us to provide information leaflets on? Would it be more information about the condition, um, about the lumbar puncture process, um, about medications or monitoring or something else? Um, so that would be really interesting and useful to know more about. Um, finally, I wanted to just um, acknowledge some of my colleagues from a little bit further afield. And um, I've um, found as many photos of people as I could, but I'm aware I haven't got photos of everybody. So apologies for that. Um, uh, the person I particularly wanted to point out was um, Dr. Krishna Kumar, who's top left there, who is my colleague and service leader, Tavern Brooks in Cambridge. Um, and um, we have um, uh, also on, on in the photos there, you can also see some other colleagues from Cambridge and some other colleagues from further afield. Um, so nationally, um, we, these are some of the people who have been involved. I'm also aware there are others who I haven't listed, um, but there is Dr. Amin in Bristol, Dr. Desai in Great Ormond Street, Dr. Forrest in Glasgow, Dr. Mehta in Hull, Dr. Muktiar in Norwich, and Dr. Prabhakar in Gosh as well, uh, Dr. Whitehouse in Nottingham, 
of course, um, I, I have not um, listed all of the people from IHUK, but I particularly wanted to mention Shelley because she has been a constant um, source of support and has always been very interested and proactive, which I think is so important um, for a patient organisation um, to have uh, to have somebody who is sort of um, as interested and, and, and willing to um, collaborate uh, as Shelley. So I really would like to thank Shelley for that. Um, Laura Kirby, who took part in our previous face-to-face -face conference, and again, has been really interested and proactive in our work. Um, and particularly wanted to mention Kira and Caroline Sanford-Reed, um, who are a patient uh, or a family um, who have contributed to our work as well. Um, so with that, I'll end my talk, um, but I would really like to hear from you either through the chat or, um, or as you wish. I'm going to stop sharing. Pooja, thank you so much for that talk. It was really interesting to hear um, the phenomenal work that is going on around the UK in paediatrics. And I think sometimes it can be difficult for people to find out what's going on around the country. And I know that's something um, we'd like to work with um, researchers and medical professionals on so that people are aware of the research that's happening ar around the country. And with our new web pages, Pooja, I'm hoping that we can work with you further so that we can have more evidence on the new websites um, and also more information that's available for parents as well. So that's certainly something we would really like to work with you on. Um, looking at the um, chat function, there's a couple of questions for you in there. Um, the first question, what we can't do is obviously in our questions, we can't address individual medical um, questions, but what we can do is talk more generically. So thinking about in paediatrics, are there lines on what constitutes a high CSF reading for lumbar puncture pressure on opening um, than in adults? Thank you. Um, so this is a, actually a question um, that generates a lot of debate amongst us in our um, professional uh, discussions as well. Um, so it's highly relevant and um, it's something that I think we probably, I probably don't have a, a full answer for you on, but I can tell you what we understand so far. Um, so when we, th when we talk about um, CSF pressure, um, of course we're aware that CSF pressure is dynamic um, and that um, a single reading is not always representative. Um, so um, historically, we've gone by opening pressures, which is the static measurement um, of the CSF pressure when you insert the needle for the lumbar puncture. Um, and um, the, the cutoff for that um, has been taken to be 28 centimetres of water in children rather than the adult um, uh, uh, cutoffs, which is slightly lower. Um, however, there is a, there is a sort of um, big caveat around that in that we know that when we use other measurements for CSF pressure, which are more um, dynamic, um, and that might be a CSF infusion study um, in, in some centres, I think Cambridge is one of the very few centres who, who use that, uh, or it might be an invasive intracranial pressure monitoring, um, then we, we may find that the um, that, that in some cases, um, the, the method of diagnosing IH may be less straightforward than going by a single opening pressure. Um, and so there can be a role for different investigations or more cautious interpretation. Um, and one of the things that um, sort of to add uh, further um, difficulty to this process, one of the things that can make things difficult is if the, um, uh, it's really important that the opening pressure is measured um, in the right way, um, and um, and so that's something that we we um, we, we sort of uh, highlight um, um, uh, and make sure that um, that that's been ad addressed. And I know that um, in the adult guidelines, that's also been stressed. Um, so although the number cut off is twenty eight centimeters of water opening pressure, there are many caveats around that. That's fantastic. Really helpful. Thank you very much, Pooja. Um, there's another question about whether IIH could be latent in children in that the child may be experiencing what is diagnosed at the time as migraines, but then develop in adulthood. It's a very interesting question. Um, 
So I think um, as far as our understanding at the moment goes, um, we have not so far come across this sort of process. Um, at least we've not been aware of it. That doesn't say that it's impossible. Um, but at the moment, um, we, we don't have a, um, a, a subgroup classification within um, either migraine or IAH of latent IAH. Um, However, there, as you say, there are um, people who have debilitating migraines in children and then go on to develop IH in adulthood. And there might be, this might be because there is something about the condition. Well, this may be another aspect of the condition that we don't fully understand. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here, which is asking about children who struggle to cope with the side effects of the medication that they're taking, for example, exhaustion or, or pain um, and asking, about coping with side effects, but also whether there are other, other treatments other than medication. Thank you. Um, so um, I think that with, within the treatment of IH, of course, we're aware of the importance of um, different modalities. Um, so that includes um, where appropriate medication, where appropriate um, we uh, incorporate uh, weight management if the child has a problem with weight management. And as, we've, as I've mentioned, not all children with pediatric IH actually fall into the overweight or obese group, but those who do, that would be an important part of their management. Um, it, within um, the management of pediatric IH, when we, when we um, uh, feel that medication is indicated, um, then we always try to use the lowest dose possible and the minimum number of medications possible. Um, we are aware that the medications that we commonly use, um, so acetazolamide and topiramate are two of the commonly used medicines, both of those come along with a number of side effects, which many children find difficult to cope with. Um, and um, because um, uh, um, uh, that, that sometimes does need a lot of support around um, trying to help the child to cope with the medication, um, I think going back to your own uh, doctor and paediatrician or, or neurologist, depending on who you're under, um, can be helpful if you feel that um, your child is, is struggling particularly with exhaustion, pain or any other side effect of medication, um, to really consider is medication the best treatment for your child. Um, in most cases, if the, if the doctor's considered that medication is needed, that's usually with a good reason, but it's always something to query um, and to consider because there are some situations where we can um, safely wean a child off medication um, and so it's important to consider that and whether that could be appropriate and whether your um, whether your child is unnecessarily struggling with medication but unfortunately in the most in the majority it's an unfortunate side effect of the medication okay we've got time just for one more question quickly um, which is um, a question about having advice within a specialist center that has experience of IIH compared to the experience out in general hospitals and how can the um, understanding of pediatric IIH be disseminated out there into the wider um, medical profession and other healthcare professions? So um, I, th I think that's what we're, um, we also are aware of um, this um, disparity that comes between um, hospitals and between um, services depending on their um, experience of IAH and other factors um, and that's really what we're trying to work on work by developing these national guidelines to try and um, reduce some of that disparity and to try and improve the care across the board so that um, in uh, what we're what we're striving for is that it shouldn't really matter which hospital you go to and which doctor sees you they should be um, uh, able to refer to a clear guideline that, that um, informs them exactly what they need to do um, as well as being able to have their, their usual support processes of, of speaking to their colleagues and, and uh, discuss, discussing wider a field as they need to uh, and again with education as well. Um, could I just add one more comment, Amanda? I saw a yes. further comment in the chat. I, I know there wasn't time for a question, but I see the comment about mental health. Um, and I completely agree that mental health is, um, is a huge um, difficulty for so many of our patients with pediatric IH and also other conditions in pediatric neurology. Um, and as pediatric neurologists, it's something that we feel is extremely important um, and is something that we, on a slightly separate note, as well as within IH, something that we're continually trying to improve the access to mental health care for, for children with a range of pediatric neurology conditions. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. And I know that uh, I mentioned earlier from IIH UK, we also have our information packs and hopefully that's something we can work once the guidelines are um, developed, we can help you with dissemination of the guidelines. Um, for those of you who are parents of children with IIH who, who are listening today, I hope you're available to stay for the next talk. And I hope, Pooja, if you have time, if you're able to listen to the, the next talk, which is about the HOPE programme, um, which we are developing in um, conjunction with um, HOPE, with Gabriella matis Tova, who will be joining us very shortly. Um, and there will be two programmes developed as part of that for parents of children with IIH, but also for adults with IIH as well. Lovely. So once again, a huge thank you to, to Pooja for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and for updating us about paediatric IIH. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I am now delighted to introduce